Want to learn your target language for free? Then get our language gifts of the month right now before they expire. Here's what you're getting this month. First, the Getting Sick Conversation Cheat Sheet. Are you able to describe your symptoms in your target language? If not, download our new conversation sheet and learn must-know words and phrases for the doctor. Second, the Language Learning Starter Pack PDF eBook. If you're new to the language, do you know what words to learn first? With this eBook, you'll get over 70 basic words and phrases that beginners need to know. Start with these words first. Download it right now. Third, can you talk about economics in your target language? Learn how to say profit, demand, taxes, and much more with this quick vocab bonus. Fourth, 30 must-know opposite nouns. Learn how to say day and night, question and answer, and much more. You'll pick up over 30 words with this vocab bonus. Fifth, free audiobooks for our members only. If you're not a member yet, sign up for a free lifetime account and unlock our huge library of language learning audiobooks. Save them to your device and listen and learn. They're yours to keep forever. And finally, the deal of the month. If you want to finally master the language with lessons by real teachers and our complete language learning program, get 35% off premium or premium plus with the power up sale. To get your gifts and language learning resources, click the link in the lesson description below. Download them right now before they expire. Hi everyone, I'm Alicia. Welcome to Conversational Phrases. We've found that the best way to learn a language is to speak it from day one. And the best way to start speaking is to learn phrases that you'll use in real conversations. In this lesson, you'll learn conversational phrases to use when talking on the phone. After watching this video, you'll be able to ask for someone on the phone and to put someone on hold. And if you want to learn more vocabulary, phrases, and example sentences you can use in real life situations, click the link in the description to download your Making a Phone Call PDF cheat sheet for free. Now, let's take a look at some conversational phrases. Listen to the dialogue. Hello, I'd like to speak with the person in charge. Okay, just a moment. Listen to it again. Hello, I'd like to speak with the person in charge. Okay, just a moment. First of all, you'll need to learn how to say hello on the phone. That's hello. Hello. Then, you'll need to learn how to say, I'd like to speak with person. The pattern is, I'd like to speak with person. For example, hello, I'd like to speak with the person in charge. Hello, I'd like to speak with the person in charge. Hello, I'd like to speak with the person in charge. Now, how do you answer this question? Okay, just a moment. Listen to it again. Okay, just a moment. Okay, just a moment. Here are a few more phrases you can use with the same pattern to talk on the phone. The person in charge. The person in charge. The person in charge. A sales representative. A sales representative. A sales representative. The manager. The manager. The manager. Customer service. Customer service. Customer service. Let's look at some examples. Listen and repeat or speak along with the native speakers. I'd like to speak with a sales representative. Okay, just a moment. I'd like to speak with the manager. Okay, just a moment. I'd like to speak with customer service. Okay, just a moment. Okay, now it's your turn. 
Do you remember how to say, I'd like to speak with person? I'd like to speak with person. And how do you answer it? Okay, just a moment. Imagine you want to talk to a sales representative. Do you remember how to say, a sales representative? A sales representative. A sales representative. Say, I'd like to speak with a sales representative. I'd like to speak with a sales representative. Now say you want to talk to a sales representative and answer it. I'd like to speak with a sales representative. Okay, just a moment. Now, imagine you want to talk to the manager. Do you remember how to say, the manager? The manager. The manager. Say, I'd like to speak with the manager. I'd like to speak with the manager. Now say you want to talk to the manager and answer it. I'd like to speak with the manager. Okay, just a moment. Now imagine you want to talk to customer service. Do you remember how to say customer service? Customer service. Customer service. Say, I'd like to speak with customer service. I'd like to speak with customer service. Now say you want to talk to customer service and answer it. I'd like to speak with customer service. Okay, just a moment. Help. 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 We use the verb help in emergency situations, and we also use it when someone gives us their assistance. Thank you for your help. Thank you for your help. Thank you for your help. Learn. 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 We use the verb learn to describe our studies. Keep in mind when we use this in past tense, it refers to something we have completed. Learn something new. Learn something new. Learn something new. Move. 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 So the verb move refers to any kind of action that's moving from one direction to another. We also use this verb to talk about moving from one house to another house. The alligators are slowly moving through the water. The alligators are slowly moving through the water. The alligators are slowly moving through the water. 17. 17. Seventeen. Seventeen is the number that comes after sixteen. His daughter is seventeen years old. His daughter is seventeen years old. His daughter is seventeen years old. Eighteen. 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 Eighteen is the number after seventeen. This number has special importance in the USA because it's the age at which people get the right to vote. He's 18 years old. He's 18 years old. He's 18 years old. 19. 19. 19. 19 is the number after 18 and before 20. There are 19 books here. There are 19 books here. 
There are nineteen books here. Twenty. 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 So twenty is the number after nineteen. He's been my friend for twenty years. He has been my friend for twenty years. He has been my friend for twenty years. Neck. 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 So your neck is this part of the body, the part of the body between your head and your shoulders. I've got a pain in my neck. I've got a pain in my neck. I've got a pain in my neck. Face. 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 So the face is this part of the body. Your face includes your eyes, your nose, your mouth, your cheeks. This is all your face. Can you show me your funniest face? Can you show me your funniest face? Can you show me your funniest face? Ear. 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 The ear is the part of the body that we use to hear. We have two ears. I have two ears. I have two ears. I have two ears. Hair. 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 So hair is anything on the body that's similar to this. It can be long hair. It can be short hair. We also use the same word to talk about hair on an animal. The woman has black hair. The woman has black hair. The woman has black hair. Mountain. 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 Mountain is a large part of the landscape, often that has snow at the top. Keep in mind when you pronounce this word in fast speech, it sounds like mountain. The T sound is reduced. The little town was nestled in the mountains. The little town was nestled in the mountains. The little town was nestled in the mountains. Beach. 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 So the beach is the area where the land meets the ocean. You might hear people talking about doing activities at the beach, which refers to the general location, or on the beach, which refers to activities on the surface of the beach. There's a lifeguard at the beach. There's a lifeguard at the beach. There's a lifeguard at the beach. Rainforest. 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 So a rainforest is different from just a forest because a rainforest is a forest in a very humid or a very tropical location. Thailand has many rainforests. Thailand has many rainforests. Thailand has many rainforests. Island. Island. I. Land. An island is a portion of land or a piece of land that is completely surrounded by water. So, like Japan is an island. An island is surrounded by water. An island is surrounded by water. An island is surrounded by water. Dictionary. 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 A dictionary is a very large book or online. It's a resource that you can use to check the meanings of words. I bought this dictionary for you. I bought this dictionary for you. I bought this dictionary for you. Blue. 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 The color blue is a very basic color. We commonly associate the color blue with things that are cold or cool. The sky is bright blue. The sky is bright blue. The sky is bright blue. 
yellow, yellow, yellow. The color yellow is very bright, and we associate this with cheerful feelings. Hannah has a yellow hat. Hannah has a yellow hat. Hannah has a yellow hat. Orange. 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 So the color orange is another very bright color. You may also know the fruit called an orange. It is orange in color. Red mixed with yellow becomes orange. Red mixed with yellow becomes orange. Red mixed with yellow becomes orange. Color. 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 So color can be used as a noun and as a verb. In this case, we're going to talk about it as a noun, which refers to any type of color. I got the wrong color. I got the wrong color. I got the wrong color. Boring. 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 Boring is an adjective, which means not interesting. My job is boring. My job is boring. My job is boring. Exciting. 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 Something that is exciting is something that is very interesting. So, like roller coasters are very exciting for many people. The movie was very exciting. The movie was very exciting. The movie was very exciting. Important. 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 So the word important means something that we need to consider carefully. Yes, the pronunciation of this word, that first T, is actually reduced. It sounds more like a D in fast speech. Water is important to our body. Water is important to our body. Water is important to our body. Credit card. Credit card. Credit card. So a credit card is a very useful method to pay for things. We use a credit card to pay for something at the moment, and then we repay our credit card company later. Do you take credit card? Do you take credit card? Do you take credit card? Key. 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 So a key is the object that we use to unlock doors or to unlock other things. I lost my car key. I lost my car key. I lost my car key. Driver's license. Driver's license. Driver's license. A driver's license is a certification we receive that explains that we are able to drive a car legally. Do you have a driver's license? Do you have a driver's license? Do you have a driver's license? Forest. 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 A forest is a very large natural area. It's filled with trees, plants, animals, and everything is wild. The raccoon is eating peanuts in the forest. The raccoon is eating peanuts in the forest. The raccoon is eating peanuts in the forest. River. 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 So a river is another natural feature. A river refers to water, often that comes from a mountaintop or another natural source, and moves down into lower elevations. The grizzly bear is running in the river. The grizzly bear is running in the river. The grizzly bear is running in the river. Ocean. 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 So the ocean is that very, very large body of water that covers most of the planet Earth. The sun sets behind the blue ocean. 
The sun sets behind the blue ocean. The sun sets behind the blue ocean. Lake. 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 A lake is a smaller body of water, though it can be very large. Lakes can be very large. They are surrounded by land. The swan is swimming in the lake. The swan is swimming in the lake. The swan is swimming in the lake. Document. 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 Document can be used as both a noun and a verb. As a noun, it means paperwork. As a verb, we use it to mean make a record of information. She signed the document and returned it. She signed the document and returned it. She signed the document and returned it. Computer. 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 So a computer is a very common machine. Most of the time when we say computer, we mean like our personal computer, like our laptop or something similar. But we also have small computers in things like our smartphones as well. I have a new computer. I have a new computer. I have a new computer. Fax machine. Fax machine. Fax machine. A fax machine is kind of an older type of machine. We use these kinds of machines to send faxes. So we send copies of documents, of paperwork, to other fax machines in other locations. Do you have a fax machine? Do you have a fax machine? Do you have a fax machine? Printer. 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 A printer is a very common machine. We use printers to create physical versions of digital documents, images, and other things. The printer at the office is broken. The printer at the office is broken. The printer at the office is broken. Mechanical pencil. Mechanical pencil. Mechanical pencil. A mechanical pencil is a type of pencil that you can push on to get more lead. Lead is the material that we use with pencils. A mechanical one does not require sharpening at all. The red mechanical pencil has a green eraser. The red mechanical pencil has a green eraser. The red mechanical pencil has a green eraser. Ruler. 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 A ruler is a tool we use to measure things. These are very stiff pieces of plastic, or perhaps metal sometimes, that we use to make straight lines and to see how long or how wide things are. I use a ruler to draw lines. I use a ruler to draw lines. I use a ruler to draw lines. Marker. 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 A marker is something we use to write on surfaces like a whiteboard. So a marker can be erased. You might also see kids using markers to color things in coloring books. The marker is running low on ink. The marker is running low on ink. The marker is running low on ink. Bank. 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 A bank is a place where your money is managed. You can open an account, you can transfer money, you can do many things with money at a bank. Is there a bank near here? Is there a bank near here? Is there a bank near here? Convenience store. Convenience store. Convenience store. A convenience store is usually a small store, often in a very、uh, easy to access part of the neighborhood, and they have daily goods, snacks, and other small things that you might need. Go to the convenience store and buy some milk. Go to the convenience store and buy some milk. 
Go to the convenience store and buy some milk. Hospital. 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 A hospital is a place that you go to to receive medical care. She works in a hospital. She works in a hospital. She works in a hospital. Wallet. 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 A wallet is something that you use to store money. You can keep bills, you can keep coins, receipts, credit cards, and other things inside a wallet. My wallet is full of receipts. My wallet is full of receipts. My wallet is full of receipts. Purse. 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 So, purse is used to refer to the bag that we use to carry around the things we need for the day. We tend to use purse to refer to women's bags. This is a big purse. This is a big purse. This is a big purse. Order. 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 We use the verb order to talk about asking for food, usually food or drinks, at a restaurant, at a cafe, or a bar. Confirm the order. Confirm the order. Confirm the order. Field. 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 A field is a large open area of grass. This can be in nature, but we also use this word to talk about sports fields. Those are large open areas of grass for football or soccer or other sports. The horse is running in the field. The horse is running in the field. The horse is running in the field. Desert. 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 A desert is a very dry place. The image of a desert is a place that has a lot of sand and where it becomes very, very hot. The sun is heating the hot desert. The sun is heating the hot desert. The sun is heating the hot desert. Boss. 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 So the word boss is used to refer to the person in charge at your workplace. Your boss is often your manager or the person above your manager. Our boss allows us to leave earlier on Wednesdays. Our boss allows us to leave earlier on Wednesdays. Our boss allows us to leave earlier on Wednesdays. Office. 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 So, office refers to a place of work. You can use it to talk about the place that you go for work. You can also talk about places where other people work with this word. The office opens at 8 o'clock. The office opens at 8 o'clock. The office opens at 8 o'clock. Coworker. Coworker. Co-worker. Your co-worker or your co-workers are the people that you work together with. So these are the people that you share information with, that you meet or communicate with every day. I go out to eat with my co-worker every Thursday. I go out to eat with my co-worker every Thursday. I go out to eat with my co-worker every Thursday. Meeting. 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 A meeting is a period of time for which you and perhaps your boss and some of your coworkers gather together to discuss some topic. I forgot that the meeting was today. I forgot that the meeting was today. I forgot that the meeting was today. Police station. Police station. Police station. A police station is a place where lots and lots of police officers stay. It's kind of like an office, but for the police. 
The police cars are parked outside the police station. The police cars are parked outside the police station. The police cars are parked outside the police station. Pharmacy. 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 A pharmacy is a place you go to receive medication. So if you've gotten medical treatment from a hospital or a clinic, you can go to a pharmacy to receive the medicine you need. Is there a pharmacy nearby? Is there a pharmacy nearby? Is there a pharmacy nearby? Bakery. 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 A bakery is a place that bakes fresh breads, cookies, and perhaps other kinds of sweets. She goes to the bakery every Sunday with her kids. She goes to the bakery every Sunday with her kids. She goes to the bakery every Sunday with her kids. Movie theater. Movie theater. Movie theater. A movie theater is a place you can go to watch movies on a big screen. You might also hear this called a cinema. This movie theater is so crowded. This movie theater is so crowded. This movie theater is so crowded. Negotiation. 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 A negotiation is a discussion, usually between two groups of people, and they want different things. So they discuss a topic and work together to find an agreement. That process is called a negotiation. After two years of negotiation, the two countries were finally able to come to an agreement. After two years of negotiation, the two countries were finally able to come to an agreement. After two years of negotiation, the two countries were finally able to come to an agreement. Contract. 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 A contract is a written agreement. It's very common to sign a contract before getting something like a mobile phone or getting a loan for something from a bank or other things. Could you come to our office to sign the contract? Could you come to our office to sign the contract? Could you come to our office to sign the contract? Business. 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 So a business is a place of work. We also use the word business to talk generally about the professional world sometimes. My dad owns a business. My dad owns a business. My dad owns a business. Deal. 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 So deal is kind of like a more casual word for agreement. After you've negotiated or discussed something with another person or another group for a while, you might reach an agreement and proclaim it or decide that it's a deal. We have a deal. We have a deal. We have a deal. Busy. 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 Busy is an adjective. It refers to having many things to do or not having very much free time. I'm busy tonight. I'm busy tonight. I'm busy tonight. Serious. 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 Serious can mean something that is not at all like a light topic. So maybe there's some very heavy topics that are considered serious. We can also use the word serious to talk about someone's personality. Someone who is serious doesn't laugh or smile very much. Depression is a very serious mental illness. Depression is a very serious mental illness. Depression is a very serious mental illness. Tired. 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 
Tired is an adjective. It means someone doesn't have a lot of energy. Maybe they're ready to go to sleep or ready to just relax. Thanks, but I'm really tired. Thanks, but I'm really tired. Thanks, but I'm really tired. Superior. 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 The word superior can refer to something that's better than something else. We can also use it to talk about the person above us in a work or school situation. My superior is very calm. My superior is very calm. My superior is very calm. Company. 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 So, company refers to a place where you work. What do you know about this company? What do you know about this company? What do you know about this company? Salary. 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 So, salary refers to the money you receive from doing a job. What are your salary requirements? What are your salary requirements? What are your salary requirements? Radio. 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 So a radio used to refer to a machine we use so that we could receive music and listen to music at home or in the car. And we still have these today, but we also have internet versions of this. I like listening to the radio. I like listening to the radio. I like listening to the radio. Television. 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 So a television is a machine that we use to receive images. We can use it to watch videos. The family is watching television. The family is watching television. The family is watching television. Internet. 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 So the internet is something that we use to receive information on a computer or on our smartphones or on other devices. I gather information from the internet. I gather information from the internet. I gather information from the internet. Newspaper. 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 A newspaper is something that we use to receive the news, and it's on paper. So it's quite literal, a newspaper, a paper that we use to read the news. I read the newspaper every morning. I read the newspaper every morning. I read the newspaper every morning. News channel. News channel. News channel. So a news channel is one channel on TV or perhaps on a web TV uh, that only plays the news. So that's the only thing that is broadcast on that channel, the news. I turn on the news channel in the evening. I turn on the news channel in the evening. I turn on the news channel in the evening. Musical instrument. Musical instrument. Musical instrument. A musical instrument is something that we use to create sounds, to create music. There are string instruments, and there are wind instruments, and there are percussion instruments. Can you play a musical instrument? Can you play a musical instrument? Can you play a musical instrument? Painting. 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 So a painting refers to a work of art that's done by using paint and a paintbrush. This painting is very artistic. This painting is very artistic. This painting is very artistic. Theater. 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 A theater is a place where you can watch a movie or you can see a play or a musical. Where is the theater? Where is the theater? Where is the theater? Musical. 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 So a musical is a type of live show. 
It's a live show where the actors and the actresses sing the story. I got tickets to a musical. I got tickets to a musical. I got tickets to a musical. Opera. 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 So an opera is different from a musical. A musical is generally kind of a more contemporary story. Operas are a bit more old-fashioned, I guess, and there's a specific type of singing that's known in the opera. My grandparents love going to the opera. My grandparents love going to the opera. My grandparents love going to the opera. Relax. 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 So to relax means to not worry so much. It means to relieve yourself of stress, to do something that you feel like good about. Relax, everything will be fine. Relax, everything will be fine. Relax, everything will be fine. Whiteboard. 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 A whiteboard is a specific type of board. It's usually white in color. We can write on it with markers, and we can also erase it. A whiteboard is a perfect means to demonstrate something visually. A whiteboard is a perfect means to demonstrate something visually. A whiteboard is a perfect means to demonstrate something visually. Blackboard. 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 So a blackboard is a board that is black in color, but we cannot use like markers to write on it and erase. We have to use chalk. The teacher writes on the blackboard. The teacher writes on the blackboard. The teacher writes on the blackboard. Test. 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 Test can be used as both a noun and as a verb. As a noun, it means an examination or some kind of written information used to check someone's knowledge. As a verb, it means to check someone's knowledge. The test is on next Tuesday. The test is on next Tuesday. The test is on next Tuesday. Textbook. 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 So a textbook is something that you use to study a topic. During the year, we will cover the entire textbook. During the year, we'll cover the entire textbook. During the year, we will cover the entire textbook. Front. 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 So front is the opposite of behind. It's something that faces you. He is in front of me. He is in front of me. He is in front of me. Job. 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 So someone's job is the thing that they do for a living. That's the thing that they do to receive money to live their life. I have a busy job. I have a busy job. I have a busy job. President. President, president. So the president of a company is the person at the top of the company. We also use president for the leader of a country. He is the president. He is the president. He is the president. Industry, industry, industry. So an industry is like a type or a category of work. Industries need to reduce their wastes. Industries need to reduce their wastes. Industries need to reduce their wastes. Belt. 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 A belt is an accessory. It goes around the waist and it's used to hold pants in place. It can also be used to hold dresses in place. The girl is wearing a red color belt. The girl is wearing a red color belt. The girl is wearing a red color belt. Coin. 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 So a coin is usually a small round shaped object. It's money, but not the paper kind. It's metal. 
I don't have coins. I don't have coins. I don't have coins. Money. 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 So money is what we use to pay for goods and to pay for services. We have paper money and we have metal money, coins. We also have digital money too. You're just wasting your money. You're just wasting your money. You're just wasting your money. Debit card. Debit card. Debit card. A debit card is similar to a credit card, but a debit card is connected directly to your bank account. So when you use a debit card, money comes directly from your bank account to pay for something. I lost my debit card and had to go to the police. I lost my debit card and had to go to the police. I lost my debit card and had to go to the police. Bill, bill, bill. There are a couple of different ways to use the word bill. So a bill can refer to paper money. We also use bill to refer to like an invoice kind of. It's when you receive a paper document, some kind of document for like your utilities, for like the electricity or the water or the internet in your home. He finally managed to pay all his bills. He finally managed to pay all his bills. He finally managed to pay all his bills. Photography. 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 Photography is a noun. It refers to the act of taking pictures. Are you studying photography? Are you studying photography? Are you studying photography? Take off. Take off. Take off. This phrasal verb can have a couple of different meanings. We can use it to mean to remove something, as in removing clothing. It can also refer to a plane leaving the ground. The plane will take off in 20 minutes. The plane will take off in 20 minutes. The plane will take off in 20 minutes. Bedroom. 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 So the bedroom is the place where you sleep. This word is easy to remember because it has bed and room. So the room where your bed is, is the room where you sleep. The view from the bedroom is beautiful. The view from the bedroom is beautiful. The view from the bedroom is beautiful. Kitchen. 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 So the kitchen is the room in a house where you prepare food. Many people also have a table in their kitchen where they eat as well. The chef cooks in the kitchen. The chef cooks in the kitchen. The chef cooks in the kitchen. Bathroom. 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 So the bathroom is the room in which there's usually a bathtub, and that's the room that we use for bathing and also where we use uh, toilets as well and to wash our hands. The bathroom has a tiny window. The bathroom has a tiny window. The bathroom has a tiny window. Graduation. 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 Graduation is a noun. It refers to the ceremony in which students finish school and are recognized for their academic achievements. You are invited to my sister's graduation. You're invited to my sister's graduation. You are invited to my sister's graduation. Promotion. 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 So promotion can have two different meanings. It can mean advertisement. We use it just the same as we use advertisement. It also refers to situations in which someone receives the opportunity to move up a level in their job. He earned this promotion. He earned this promotion. He earned this promotion. Anniversary. 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 
An anniversary is a celebration of a significant day. So usually we have wedding anniversaries, or perhaps there's like an anniversary for a shop or a company opening. Best wishes for your anniversary. Best wishes for your anniversary. Best wishes for your anniversary. Funeral. 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 A funeral is a ceremony where people gather to remember a person who has passed away. A funeral is a time to grieve and remember. A funeral is a time to grieve and remember. A funeral is a time to grieve and remember. Wedding. 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 A wedding is a ceremony in which two people come together and agree to a partnership for life. When is the wedding? When is the wedding? When is the wedding? Explain. 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 To explain means to describe something, usually in detail. Can you explain that to me once more? Can you explain that to me once more? Can you explain that to me once more? Back. 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 So one's back can refer to this part of the body, the part that is not the front of the body. It can also refer to the rear side of something. At the back of our house, we have a garden. At the back of our house, we have a garden. At the back of our house, we have a garden. East. 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 So east is the opposite of west. The sun rises in the east. The sun rises in the east. The sun rises in the east. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about how to use would for unreal situations in the past and in the future. I'm going to talk about making statements and making some information questions. Let's get started. Okay, I want to begin by talking about using would for past situations. So for past and future situations, we use would to describe unreal situations. So unreal means something that did not happen. In this case, in the past, it's something that did not happen. But we want to talk about maybe something we think, in our case, we might have done if it were us in the past, or we might not have done. So we maybe want to talk about changes to actions in the past. So these are for situations that are not real, so they did not happen. Let's look at the positive expression then. So when we make a positive statement using would in the past, we're talking about a plan or an opinion or something similar about an unreal past situation. So we make a statement with a pattern like this. We begin with subject, would have, and the past participle form of the verb. So again, this is for the past use of would. So for example, I would have called you earlier, or he would have given you more time, for example. So this have plus the past participle verb creates a past tense structure. So this part, this is a key difference between past and future uses of would. So here is how we make a positive statement. I'll show some examples in just a moment, some more examples. First, let's look at how to make a negative statement here. So a negative would express an alternate plan or opinion for an unreal past situation. So this means, for example, something happened. Maybe, for example, I called someone. If I use the negative form of would to talk about that situation and I say, I would not have called that person, I'm giving an alternate plan. So this happened, I called someone. 
But when I'm talking about the situation later, I might want to say that it could have been a good idea to change that action. I would not have called that person. So we're talking about an alternate plan, something different. So some change to a past action. So the change did not happen, but it's so it's an unreal situation. It's not true, it's not real, but we want to describe maybe something we might have done differently in the past. So I'll show some examples in just a moment. We make this by using, again, the subject followed by would. To make it negative, we add not. Subject would not, and we use the same have plus the past participle verb. Would not have past participle verb. So in my example just now, I said, I would not have called you, or he would not have come, for example. When we're using the negative form, there's often some kind of other information. So we're talking about some maybe condition, uh, often with if. So again, I'll show that in just a moment. Finally, a simple pattern that you can use to make information questions for past would uh, situations is this. Our WH question begins the question. So who, what, where, when, why, how. So uh, our WH question begins followed by would the subject have, again, and the past participle verb. For example, what would you have done in that situation? Or where would he have gone, for example? So we can build very basic would questions about the past with this kind of pattern. Now I want to look at a couple of pronunciation points that deal with these two sentence patterns. First, when you're using this positive pattern, the pronunciation becomes something like this, subject plus this d sound and v sound. So what does this mean? Here, the subject, the subject remains the same, I or he or she or we, for example. This D right here, this D sound is the would. So we reduce the would sound to D. So this means I'd, he'd, she'd, we'd, they'd. So it's a D sound, a very quick D sound. Then this VE portion, V, sound comes from have, have. So would have becomes dv, dv in very fast speech. I'd've, he'd've, she'd've, they'd've, we'd've, you'd've, for example, div, div. So this is one big point to listen for. Another thing that will tell you if this is a past situation, a past statement, is the type of verb that's used here. So if you're listening to this verb as well, you can hear if the person uses a past participle verb in connection with this kind of pronunciation, you know that it's a past would statement, not, for example, a future would statement. So there are a few hints to listen for here. Would've, so there's this v sound, and then there's this past participle verb sound. So this is when you're making a situation, uh, this is when it's connecting directly to a subject, like I'd've, he'd've, she'd've. Uh, so when you're making a, this is for positive statements as well. When you're making a negative, however, um, it becomes something like this. I've written here, wouldn't, wouldn't. So um, I've, I don't have the subject here, but we would include the subject here again, so I, wouldna, he wouldna, she wouldna. So we can imagine the subject remains here. I did not include it in this section because the pronunciation of the subject part doesn't really connect so much as it does with the positive. In positive sentence structures, this subject would and have closely connect. In negative structures, this connection is not quite as strong. So I wouldn't, perhaps there's a little bit of a connection, but not as strong. I want to focus instead here on this na, 
n part. So would, we can see, remains the same. So for the negative sentence, would remains the same. Subject would. But here, this n is the not part. This is the not part, wooden, wooden. So for example, maybe you know wouldn't, which I'll talk about later. So this n sound is the not part. This a sound is the have part. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have done that. She wouldn't have come. We wouldn't have called, for example. So this part right here actually means not have not have, I wouldn't, she wouldn't, they wouldn't, we wouldn't. So this is another key difference between the negative form and the positive form in your pronunciation. So you can hear it's quite different. This is one thing to practice, of course, and to listen carefully for. So with this in mind, let's look at a few example sentences. First, a positive sentence. I would have come, but I had to work. I would have come, but I had to work. So here, um, I could reduce this. I've made this a very clear sentence. I would have come. Uh, so I'd have come would probably be the way a native speaker would pronounce this, just as I've introduced here. My subject is I. I reduce would to d, and I make the v sound for have. So, I would have come becomes, I'd have come, but I had to work. I'd have come is how it sounds. Let's look at another example with a different subject. He would have helped, but he was cooking. He would have helped, but he was cooking. Again, my subject, he, connects to the would word, which is reduced to d, and have becomes v. So he'd have helped, but he was cooking. He'd have helped, but he was cooking, is how a native speaker would say this. So what do these sentences mean? I would have come, but I had to work. So in this case, maybe come to an event, for example. I would have come, but I had to work. So that means a past situation, maybe I wanted to come to the party, I wanted to come to the event, but I had to work. So this communicates maybe the speaker had a desire or had a plan, a plan of some kind, to do something in the past, but it did not happen. In this case, the reason is the speaker had to work. I would have come, but I had to work. So we use would to express that. You could say, I wanted to come, but I had to work. That would communicate pretty much the same idea. In this sentence, he would have helped, but he was cooking. So, for example, maybe would have helped cleaning, maybe cleaning a house, but he was cooking. So, again, in the past, he, in this situation, maybe could have, it was possible, or maybe he wanted to help, but he was cooking. There was some other responsibility. So, these are common patterns. Like, we want to express a past action we might have changed, but that we were not able to do because of some other reason. Let's continue on to a couple of negative examples now. First, she wouldn't have left early if she had known you needed help. She wouldn't have left early if she had known you needed help. So here we have our subject, she, which I talked about here. And then I have here wouldn't. So I reduced uh, would not together. You might see this as well. Wouldn't, wouldn't. This is would and not. Wouldn't have, to make it even more natural, we would say she wouldn't, she wouldn't. She wouldn't have left early if she had known you needed help. So in this case, she, in this situation, left early. She did leave early. That was the situation, the true situation. But the speaker, in this case, wants to explain that she, this person, would not have, she would have changed this action if she had known this other person needed help. So perhaps this is a communication related issue. So she maybe would have stayed. So that was the change in the action. She perhaps might have stayed if the she here knew this third party needed some help. So wouldn't have, this means 
this person did leave. She did leave. So again, this is an unreal situation. So um, let's continue on to see another example of this then. We wouldn't have called the police if we hadn't thought the situation was dangerous. Again, we wouldn't or wouldna. We wouldn't have called the police if we hadn't thought the situation was dangerous. Here, we wouldn't have called the police. This means the speaker did call the police. The speaker did call the police. So we wouldn't have called the police means is or rather is attached here because the speaker is saying they thought the situation was dangerous. So we would not have called the police. So in other words, um, we might not have or that would not have been our plan if we hadn't thought the situation was dangerous. This is a past tense part too. This part is all in past tense. So that means the speaker felt some past situation was dangerous. And they're saying that's why we called the police. If we had not thought that situation was dangerous, we would not have called the police. So this is kind of, it may seem to be a sort of confusing way to communicate this idea, but you may hear patterns like this from time to time to reinforce maybe someone's plan or someone's actions. Okay, so let's continue with this in mind then. Let's continue on to looking at how to use it for future unreal situations. When we use would for a future unreal situation, we're expressing like a potential, so it's something that could happen, there's a possibility, a potential action for an unreal situation in the future. So a potential action, or this can mean potentially no action. So I'll explain with some examples here. Another point about this usage, we often, or usually I have here, um, use these in response to an if question. So if you were, if he were, for example, or we pair it with an if clause. So we saw this actually in these uh, negative example sentences here. Uh, this is quite common when we're using it to talk about future unreal situations. So first, let's look at how to make these. To make a positive statement, we use subject plus would plus the present tense form of the verb. So here we see a key difference. When we're using the future form, we're not using have. In the past, we used have and the past participle form of the verb. Here, we're using no have, there's nothing here, and the present tense form of the verb. When we make a negative sentence then, it's the same. We drop have and we're using the present tense. So there's no change to the verb here. In the negative form, we simply add not. Then, when we're making questions, we follow a similar pattern. We use our WH question, who, what, where, when, why, how, plus would, plus our subject, and again, a present tense verb. So, as we did over here with the past form, let's look at the pronunciation points here. This is a little bit simpler. When we use a positive statement, we can use the subject plus this apostrophe D. So, I'd, he'd, she'd, we'd. When we use the negative form, we use wouldn't. I wouldn't, he wouldn't, she wouldn't. So, there are only these two to consider. Let's see how we would use these to make some questions and answers. I included a couple of example questions uh, that are fairly common patterns, I think, so you can see how to make uh, some common questions with would. For example, what would you do if you won the lottery? What would you do if you won the lottery? The lottery is a cash, a money prize. So you buy a ticket and there's a chance you win a big cash prize. That's called a lottery. What would you do? So here we see if you won the lottery. Here we have this if part. So this is a future unreal situation. It's possible, there's maybe a low chance of it happening, but we're talking about 
your future actions or maybe your future plans or opinions here. So, what would you do if you won the lottery? The speaker's response in this case, I would buy my parents a house. I would buy my parents a house. So, you'll notice here, I'm not saying if I won the lottery, I would buy my parents a house. It's okay to say that, but it's also okay to drop it. When we understand the question, we don't have to repeat the question. You can if you want to practice, but a native speaker would respond like this, and a native speaker would probably reduce this to I'd. I'd buy my parents a house. So, I'd shows it's a future unreal uh, decision, a future unreal situation. Another person, you might say, he would take a long vacation. So if he won the lottery, he would take a long vacation. So this is the speaker's idea about someone else's future plan, future unreal plan. So we don't know that it's going to happen. It's kind of an idea or a guess about someone's choice. Let's look at another question. What would you do if you lost your job? So you can see there's these common what would you do if, what would you do if type patterns. And then here we have the unreal situation in the future. These answers, uh, sorry, these answers rather, these answers use the negative form though. What would you do if you lost your job? The speaker says, I wouldn't spend a lot of money. I wouldn't spend a lot of money. So the speaker's saying, if I lost my job in the future, it's not a real situation. If it happened, my, my future action would be to not spend a lot of money. I would not spend a lot of money in that situation, which is unreal right now. But if it happened, that's what I would do. We use would to talk about that possible situation. Another example, she wouldn't be happy. She wouldn't be happy. So if she lost her job, she wouldn't be happy. So that's talking about her condition, actually. So we don't only have to describe like our behaviors, our actions, we can also talk about our conditions, our emotional, or our mental states. She wouldn't be happy. She would be upset, for example. Uh, so we can use something like this to respond to these if questions, if and would, are, are commonly paired together. So this is a quick introduction to actually a kind of complex grammar point, but I hope that it helps you understand how to use would for past and future unreal situations. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to let us know in the comment section of this video. Of course, if you like the video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel if you haven't already, and please check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this lesson, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about using should. I'm going to explain using should for the past and for the future. So I'm going to introduce how you make statements and questions for past tense use of should. And I'm gonna talk about the same thing for future tense uses of should. So let's begin. I want to start this lesson by talking about the past tense version. When we use should in the past, in a positive statement, we do it to express regret. So regret means a sorry feeling or a sad feeling. So it expresses regret for something that did not happen. So this is a key point here. Yes, it's a positive statement, but we're talking about something that did not happen and we, we feel sad about it. So to visualize this, I've created a timeline here with the past over here, now the present, our conversation, and future. So if you can imagine, uh, when we make positive statements with should in the past tense, we can imagine it's something that did not happen. So it's before the present, before now, did not happen, and we feel sad about it. So, when we want to make a sentence like this, we can use a pattern such as this one. This is a very basic pattern. We can use subject plus should plus 
have, and then the past participle form of a verb. So this part right here, this makes it a past tense statement. We'll see this is quite different when we're making future tense statements. So I'll show some examples of this in just a moment. Let's compare this then to the negative form. When we make a negative statement using should in the past, it expresses regret, again that sad feeling, it expresses regret for something that happened. So yes, it's a negative sentence, but this action happened, it was real. So again, to imagine this visually, in the past, something actually did happen. So I used a check mark here. This is a true event, a real event. And we regret, or there's some kind of sad feeling about that thing. So when we make sentences in the negative with this grammar point, we can use subject again, plus should. Here we'll use should not and then complete this pattern with have and the past participle verb. So the only change here is using not when we make the negative, there's nothing here. So this is the basic kind of uh, statement structure for past tense statements with should. Then I've added here um, a simple question structure, a simple information question structure here. We can use a WH question. WH means who, what, when, where, why, how, those kinds of things. So we use a WH question with should plus our subject, have, and the past participle verb. So I'll explain a few examples of this in just a moment. With this, I want to continue to the next part over here, which is pronunciation tips. So you've noticed perhaps that should and have and should not have, um, when people are speaking, these become reduced or these become much shorter. So you'll hear these two used most commonly. We don't really say should have or should not have so clearly. When we're making positive sentences, the most common reduction is this should've, should've. So should've, this is should apostrophe V should've, should've. This should comes from should have. So this have, it's like we drop the ha part and just use the v sound. So should've, should've. To make it even shorter, you'll often hear people use shoulda, shoulda. So this a uh sound is like taking only this a here in have, but it just becomes very short. I shoulda. I should not is the negative form of this. So let's continue on. As I've just said, shouldn't have, we contract this should not here. Should not contracts to shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't have. But to make it even shorter, we often say shouldna, shouldna. So positive shoulda, negative shouldna, shouldna, shouldna. So let's take a look at some examples that use these patterns. First, let's look at two positive statements. I should have studied more. I should have studied more. And we should have gone to the store. We should have gone to the store. So here we see should is followed by have and then the past participle form of the verb, in this case studied and gone. So this shows us that we have a past tense statement. These statements express regret. So when we're speaking quickly, we probably won't say I should have studied more or we should have gone to the store. I would say I should have studied more and we should have gone to the store. So as I explained, this pronunciation is the most common one, should have. I should have studied more. We should have gone to the store. Let's compare this to two negative statements then. She shouldn't have done that. So here I've already reduced this, shouldn't. She shouldn't have done that. And you shouldn't have had so much to drink. So again, these two express regret for something that did happen. So in both of these sentences, that something, whatever this is, this was a bad thing. The speaker thinks this was bad. In the second sentence as well, the speaker thinks this was a bad choice. So expressing regret about something that happened. Then 
Again, as I talked about here, I would reduce this even more. I've got shouldn't in both of these sentences, but in everyday speech, we would probably say she shouldn't have done that and you shouldn't have had so much to drink. You shouldn't have done that, you shouldn't have had so much to drink. So this shouldna and shoulda, these are key pronunciation points that will help you um, kind of in your listening and also to help you sound a little more natural. Okay, let's finish this part by looking at two questions then. First, what should we have done differently? What should we have done differently? And where should we have gone? Where should we have gone? So both of these they maintain, they keep that feeling of regret. When you're using a question like this, you're asking about something it would have been better to do in the past. So it's a question, that means uh, an action happened, yes. And these questions are about improvements to that action. So here, for example, what should we have done differently? What should we have done differently means, for example, the speaker or a group um, here speaking made a decision but perhaps it was not the right decision or it was a bad decision so the speaker is asking what choice what should we have done differently is like saying what do you think would have been better in the past what should we have done differently same thing in the second sentence where should we have gone? Where should we have gone? So maybe the speaker went to the wrong location and they're asking for advice in the past. Of course, we cannot change this, but this is actually a common way that we ask for like future advice. So it's recognizing, oh, I made a mistake in the past. So maybe next time I have a similar situation, what do you recommend? But we use this kind of grammar to ask these sorts of questions like, okay, in this case, where should I have gone? What should we have done differently? So that you can think about that for the future. So these are situations where you might use questions like these. Okay, with that then, with past tense, let's move on to looking at future uses of should. So, let's begin again with positive statements. So, when we make a positive statement with should, we're expressing advice, actually. So, we don't have that regret feeling here. We're expressing advice, and the speaker thinks this advice is a good idea. So, again, to visualize it, here, we're looking at a different point in time. With the past, we were talking about something that finished or something that did not happen. Here, we're talking about an action in the future. So here is my conversation now. When we make a positive statement with should, we're talking about something the speaker thinks is a good idea in the future, an upcoming thing. So I've marked it with a check. To make a positive statement, a simple pattern is your subject plus should, and here the present tense form of your verb. So in past tense, we use this past participle form. Here we're using the present tense form of the verb, so no verb change is necessary here. Now, let's compare this to a negative statement. So a negative statement with should also expresses advice, yes, but the speaker thinks it's a bad idea. This is a bad idea. So positive, good idea, negative, bad idea with should. Then to make a negative statement, an advice statement about the future, we use subject plus should not, and again, the present tense form of the verb. So you'll notice again, this is very similar to the past tense form. Just keep in mind, we also don't use have. There's no have in present or rather future forms of this. Okay, then again, let's finish with a simple question pattern too. When we make a question, like an information question, we can begin with this WH question word plus should, our subject, and then the present tense form of the verb. So this is a key point for um, the difference between these two. We're using different verb forms for future and past tenses. 
Okay, let's move along then to some pronunciation points here. This one is much shorter um, than the past tense version, but uh, when we're using should uh, to make a positive statement, there's not really a change, should. Uh, here though, I would recommend definitely use the reduced shouldn't, shouldn't. It's going to sound more natural than should not. So just a quick point here, try to use this shouldn't sound. Okay, so let's look at some examples that use this. Let's start with some positive expressions. First, you should find a new job. You should find a new job and he should work harder. He should work harder. So you'll notice here again, we have should plus our present tense verb form. So find and work are both present tense verbs. You should find a new job. He should work harder. So the speaker thinks these are good ideas. So these are positive statements, positive advice uh, bits, I guess. Um, let's compare this to some negative statements then. She shouldn't give up. She shouldn't give up. And you shouldn't eat so much junk food. You shouldn't eat so much junk food. So these two are expressing something the speaker thinks is a bad idea. So in the first sentence, she shouldn't give up. In other words, to give up is bad or giving up is a bad idea. In the second sentence, you shouldn't eat so much junk food is saying eating a lot of junk food is a bad idea. So here you'll notice maybe too, I've called this future. These are just kind of general life recommendations. I call it the future here because it's like saying from now on, from this conversation on, this is my advice for you. So maybe, especially in a sentence like this, you shouldn't eat so much junk food. Maybe the speaker is looking at someone eating a lot of junk food and they give this advice. You shouldn't eat so much junk food. Okay. So let's finish then with a couple of questions. So common questions. First one, what should I do? What should I do? A very common advice question. And second, when should we leave? When should we leave? So in native pace, I would say, what should I do? And when should we leave? So these are common questions. These are asking for advice in the future here. So asking, what do you think? In other words, what's your opinion? What should I do? In other words, what do you think is a good idea for me for the future? And in the second sentence, when should we leave? What time do you think is a good time to leave in the future? So we can make these kinds of questions as well, giving um, or rather asking for future advice. Okay, so that's a quick introduction to using should for past tense statements and questions and for future tense statements and questions. I hope that it helped you. Of course, if you have any other questions or if there's something else you'd like to know about this grammar point, please feel free to let us know in the comments of this video. Also, if you liked the video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel if you have not already, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this lesson and I will see you again soon. Bye bye. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about the differences between the verb listen and hear. I'm going to talk about two ways that we use these verbs and we're going to compare a few grammar points and usage points. So let's get started. Okay, let's begin with the verb hear. We'll start with this meaning. So the basic meaning of the verb hear is to have sound enter the ear. So that's it. It's just sound coming into the ear, anyone's ear, an animal's ear even. So to hear just refers to this motion, if you can imagine it visually, of sound coming into the ear. So some example sentences that use this meaning. First, I can hear kids playing. So this is a common way that we use the verb hear along with can. So I am able to hear kids playing. So the sound of kids playing uh, can enter my ear is what this means. We can also use it in past tense, like we heard a loud noise. Keep in mind that this is an irregular verb, so we don't use heared, but we use heard, 
heard is the past tense form of this verb. We heard a loud noise. So that means the sound of a loud noise entered our ears. One more example in a question this time. Have you ever heard a traditional song? So this is the past participle form of the verb. Have you ever heard a traditional song? So in other words, has a traditional song, the sound of a traditional song, ever entered your ear? So this is the most basic meaning of the verb here. Another very common meaning of the verb here is this, to receive communication. So to receive communication can mean something spoken, something we use our words, speech, to do, or it can mean written communication, like emails or letters. So we use here to talk about receiving that information. Some examples of this. First, past tense again. He heard the bad news this morning. He heard the bad news. This could mean actually receiving information uh, with the ear, like in this case. It could also mean receiving the information in an email. But either way, the key communication point is something like information, some kind of information was passed to this person. So he learned the information. He received some kind of communication, in this case, bad news. Let's look at a question now. This is a common question. Did you hear? Did you hear? And then we follow it with like the information we want to ask about. Did you hear? The meeting time changed. So this means, did you receive communication about this point? The meeting time changed. Did you hear? This is a really common question we use to ask about communication sharing. Okay, one more example. She hears everything from her boss. She hears everything from her boss. This means she receives all her communication from her boss. So these are kind of the two most common meanings of the verb hear. There's one key point. You'll notice I haven't used the progressive form or the continuous form in these example sentences. So the progressive form is quite rarely used with this verb. We rarely use um, the ing form hearing in the progressive. I've included a couple examples though um, in cases where you might hear it in the progressive. So with this first meaning, I talked about how hear um, can mean to have sound enter the ear. So in a question like this, are you hearing this? We might use hearing uh, in this progressive form to mean like, is this something else that you are currently in the state of being able to hear? That's a really strange way to say that. But um, this is something that you might hear in like a movie. So if you imagine, for example, there are police officers and they are listening, I'll talk in a moment, they're listening to like um, some kind of audio feed, like they're listening to something in another room. They hear something suspicious. And if one person wants to confirm the other person can hear the same thing, they might use, are you hearing this? So that means there's a sound that's continuing and one person wants to confirm the other person can hear the same sound. So the sound is continuing. That's why this progressive form is used. Like, are you hearing this? So that's one case where you might hear uh, the verb hear used in the progressive tense. Then this second meaning I talked about to receive communication. This is an example of when you might use hearing, the progressive form for this one. In a statement like, I'm hearing a lot about something, like I'm hearing a lot about some policy changes, or I'm hearing a lot about the weather lately. So hearing, I'm hearing, I'm hearing a lot about something means I'm receiving a lot of communication recently about something. So these are a couple situations where you might use hear in the progressive tense, but in most cases we use them not in the progressive tense. So, with that in mind, I already started using the verb listen, um, but I want to move on to um, showing the differences with this verb and here. So let's begin with this first meaning. Um, the first meaning of listen is to focus attention on a sound, to focus your attention on a sound. So this is a key difference with this meaning of hear. So with hear, we're just, uh, sound is coming into the ear we're not really focusing on it, it's just there. 
With listen, however, we are focusing our attention. So, examples of this. Let's listen to some music. So here, I'm focusing my attention on music, or I want to. I'm suggesting we focus attention on music. In this example, listen to me. So listen to the speaker. Please focus your attention on the things the speaker is saying. Third, what are you listening to? So here we see in the progressive tense, uh, common for this verb, what are you listening to? What are you focusing your sound uh, attention on? So you'll notice in each of these example sentences, I'm using the preposition to. So when you're using this verb, we'll use it with to, to describe or to indicate the thing we are focusing our attention on. So in this case, to music, to me. And what are you listening to? This is a common question. We end with this preposition. You could say, to what are you listening? But it's not so natural. It sounds a little too formal. A more common question is, what are you listening to? You could ask this to someone who is wearing headphones, for example. So, this is the first meaning and the most basic meaning of listen. So if you want to talk about music, if you want to talk about like a video you're watching, for example, you can use listen. So focusing your attention on something you can hear. Okay, with that in mind, let's go on to the second use or another use of listen. This one is also very common. This use of listen means to obey or like to follow a rule or to follow advice, to follow instructions. So it's a little bit different from this meaning of listen. Example, first example. He never listens to our advice. He never listens to our advice. So this use of listen, um, it means that this person maybe actually focuses their attention on hearing something, yes, but in this meaning it means he doesn't follow what we say he should do, like he does not obey our advice. So if we say, for example, you should get up early every day and he does not do that, we could say he never listens to our advice to get up early, for example. So listen in this way means obey, to obey something. Here in the second example sentence, I always listened to my parents when I was a kid. Here I have past tense, listened. You'll notice this is a regular verb, so we use ed at the end of the verb to make the past tense form. I always listened to my parents when I was a kid. So this shows a repeated action, a regular action, um, when the speaker was a kid. So this use of listen means followed advice or followed instructions from parents here. So I always listened to, it would be kind of strange to say this, like I always focused my attention on the things that my parents said. Like it could be something that's real, I suppose, but in this use, it means followed instructions from someone's parents. One more example, you should listen to your manager. This one um, probably means to obey, yes. There are some cases where perhaps the manager is giving a speech, for example, and someone might say, hey, you should listen to your manager, like the manager is speaking now. But in most cases, this probably means to obey or to follow the instructions of one's manager. So you'll notice there are a couple of differences, a couple of different kind of um, feels, feelings rather, um, that we see in these. So again, to focus attention on a sound and to obey or to follow instructions. So you'll notice again here we're using the preposition to as well. So this is a quick introduction to the differences between the verbs listen and hear. I hope that it was helpful for you, but if you have any questions or if you want to practice making example sentences or if you have any other comments, please feel free to let us know in the comment section of this video. Of course, if you like the video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel if you haven't already, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this lesson and I will see you again soon. Bye bye. Hey everyone, welcome to the monthly review, the monthly show on language learning, where you discover new learning strategies, motivational tips, study tools, and resources. By the way, all the lessons and bonuses you're about to see can be downloaded for free on our website. So click the link in the description right now to sign up for your free lifetime account.
Okay, today's topic is the power of textbooks and digital detox. In this digital age where we're all using apps and smartphones to learn languages, you might not think of a textbook as the first resource to turn to, right? But if you're avoiding textbooks, then you're missing out on some powerful language learning benefits. So today you'll learn why textbooks are still a powerful resource in the digital age, why some, but not all, digital resources might hurt your ability to learn, and how to do a digital detox and learn off screen with our program. And we're giving away a brand new conversation cheat sheet, so keep watching. But first, here are this month's new lessons and resources. Be sure to download these now before we take them down in a few days. First, the Getting Sick Conversation Cheat Sheet. Are you able to describe your symptoms in your target language? If not, download our new conversation sheet and learn must-know words and phrases for the doctor. Second, the Language Learning Starter Pack PDF eBook. If you're new to the language, do you know what words to learn first? With this ebook, you'll get over 70 basic words and phrases that beginners need to know. Start with these words first. Download it right now. Third, can you talk about economics in your target language? Learn how to say profit, demand, taxes, and much more with this quick vocab bonus. Fourth, 30 must-know opposite nouns. Learn how to say day and night, question and answer, and much more. You'll pick up more than 30 words with this vocab bonus. To get your free resources, click the link in the description below right now. They're yours to keep forever. Okay, let's jump into today's topic. The power of textbooks and digital detox. You probably have some language learning apps on your phone, right? But do you have any textbooks? Let us know in the comment section. Digital resources like apps and physical resources like books have their pros and cons. But if you're learning with digital resources only, you might be missing out on some benefits that come with physical resources. What are they? First, a digital detox. This is a basic one. A textbook gives you a break from the screen. You're not sitting in front of so much blue light all day, which can have an impact on your sleep. That's just for your overall health. Second, the ability to focus and improve your focus. Here's a question for you. How long is your attention span? Five minutes, 10 minutes? The thing is, attention and the ability to focus are crucial for learning and succeeding with any goal in life. But if you're learning on a device, you'll get pop-ups and notifications. If you're on YouTube, well, the algorithm will have you watching cat videos soon enough. These things are designed to keep you jumping from one thing to the next, and all of this hurts your attention span and your ability to learn. With a book, it's much easier to focus, and consistently learning with one can help improve your focus. Third, if the book has a really good story to follow, it makes it more fun to learn. This may not be something you can find in every textbook, but you can find it in textbook resources like bilingual storybooks. Fourth, you get a clear path to follow. Textbooks give you a linear path from page one to 100. You know where to go next, how far you are from the end, and what you have left to learn. With an app, you'll be forever swiping and not really knowing if you're getting anywhere. Fifth, Textbooks have gone through academic rigor, meaning they've been made by teachers or checked by teachers. So you're learning the correct forms, the correct language, and you can rely on it to be accurate. If you Google for blogs about phrases to learn, there's a chance the information is not completely accurate. Sixth, textbook lessons are curated and organized so that what you learn on page one helps you understand page two and so on. It builds you up and teaches you crucial language skills that beginners need to know, like how to introduce yourself first, then how to grow that conversation. As an added bonus, you can write in them. What about the downsides of textbooks? There are a few. The content gets old fast. Language always changes. There's new slang. So that's where digital lessons do well. Also, books can get boring and overwhelming. An approach you can consider for a textbook is to put in a certain amount of time, say 20 or 30 minutes a day, and then walk away so you're not overwhelmed. But by providing a digital detox, allowing us a framework for focus, offering reduced distractions, being easy to follow and accurate, textbooks are powerful in a digital world. So should you go for digital detox and get a textbook? If you can handle a bit of change to your routine, then why not? If you're worried about learning the same thing from two sources, don't worry. 
Learning something like a grammar rule from multiple angles will only help you understand it better and reinforce your memory. A book will give you a clear direction of where to go, what to learn, and challenge your mind in ways that digital lessons might not. So, how do you do a digital detox and learn with our program? First, you can print out our extensive reading books. Extensive reading is a learning tactic where you read books that are appropriate for your level, and the goal is quantity over quality. You should read a lot and skip over the words you don't know. To access these, just visit the lesson library to find our extensive reading books. Second, download our PDF lesson notes and print them out. The lesson notes give you the lesson in writing, the dialogue, the vocab, grammar explanations, sample sentences, and cultural insights. Find the lesson notes in every one of your lessons. Third, use our printable visual flashcards. With these, you'll learn over 1,500 of the most common words. If you want the link to the visual flashcards, just leave a comment and we'll reply with it. Fourth, you can also use our printable conversation cheat sheets. With these, you'll learn words and phrases for the most common conversation topics. If you want the link to our collection of cheat sheets, again, leave a comment and we'll reply with it. Remember, the ultimate goal here is to go for a digital detox, challenge your brain in a new way, and try new resources. So thank you for watching this episode of Monthly Review. Next time, we'll talk about how to start conversations, talking points for language learners. If you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. And if you're ready to finally learn language the fast, fun, and easy way and start speaking from your very first lesson, get our complete learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account right now. Just click the link in the description. See you next time. Bye. Have you ever started learning a language but just couldn't continue? Why does this happen? And what do successful language learners do differently? In this video, we're going to talk about why you should put your language learning on autopilot. We asked you, and the number one reason people don't continue is time. Either you don't make the time for learning or you're just too busy. But a lot of the time, this is caused by the resources you're using. If you've downloaded five language apps and bought two books, you'll get overwhelmed about where to start and what to do next. So what do successful language learners do? Successful learners don't overwhelm themselves thinking, what should I do today? They put their learning on autopilot. Imagine this. Let's say you have a favorite TV show. A new episode comes out every Tuesday. So you know what you're doing on Tuesday night. You don't have to think about it. You don't need a reminder. It's automatic. Every Tuesday, you watch an episode. You make it into a habit. Now, how do we apply that to language learning? First, habits. If you have a habit of learning, then you're already on autopilot. So set a small, measurable, monthly goal with a deadline, like learn 100 words or do 30 lessons by the end of the month. Once you know your goal, you can backtrack. So for example, divide 100 words by 30 days in a month, and you get 3.33. So you should learn about three words a day. Now you know what to do. Three words a day, there's no confusion. Do those three words and you're done. You don't need to think about what you should be doing because you already know what you're doing. It becomes a habit. The second way to stay on autopilot is with language textbooks. This is basically just because books are sequential. You just follow the pages from one until the end. You don't have to think about where to go next, so it's easy to stay on track with what you need to do. Third, the word of the day. Every day you get a new word in your email inbox automatically. You don't have to think about it. Simply check your email, learn a word, and you're done. The fourth way is with our progress tracking tools. They spoon feed you lessons one by one. So let's say you finished lesson one where you learned greetings, then you automatically load up lesson two where you learn a basic conversation that uses the greetings you learned in lesson one. Then you have lesson three and four and so on. You don't have to worry about what to do next because our dashboard will keep you on track. It'll even build upon what you learned in your previous lesson so you won't forget it. The point is to put your learning on autopilot. You need something that guides you from A to B to C, whether it's your own habits or a book that takes you from one to 100 or a learning program that feeds you lessons. So take one of these tips and apply it today. 
So to put your learning on autopilot, just check out our complete language learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account by clicking on the link in the description. Get tons of resources to have you speaking in your target language. And if you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share this video with anyone who's trying to learn a language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. I'll see you next time. Bye. Are you focused on active language learning or passive language learning? And which is the best way to learn? In this video, you'll learn the difference between active and passive learning and some methods for each. Do you know the difference between active and passive learning? You'll find out the differences between these two. First, the difference between active and passive learning. Here's the difference. Active learning means you're actively engaging with learning material and focusing on it. For example, you're reading in your target language, you're looking up words, you're translating, you're memorizing phrases, or you're speaking out loud. So you're focused on what you're learning and you're really into it. Now, passive learning is different. It requires less concentration. It's usually done when you're doing something else. For example, doing chores, driving to work, or taking the train. You could be listening to an audio lesson or watching a video lesson. But the difference is you're not focused on picking apart every word. You're just passively taking the language in. What about you? How do you usually learn? Do you have a lot of active practice? A lot of passive practice? Do you have a combination? Let us know in the comments. Second, how you can learn both ways with our lessons. If you do a lot of passive learning, say because you're always on the go, then here are four simple tactics you can apply right now. One, press play on a lesson and just listen or watch, just like you would with YouTube. So if you're at home with your computer on, press play on a lesson and take it in. Two, now if you're outside, if you're going to the store or commuting, you can learn with our free Innovative Language 101 app for the Android, iPhone, and iPad. Again, open a lesson, press play, and that's it. If you want to passively review words and phrases, then check out the vocabulary slideshow tool. This premium study tool is available on every lesson and vocab list. Just press play, and with every slide, you'll get the word, the audio pronunciation, the translation, and sample sentences. You can even put the slideshow on loop and immerse yourself that way. And third, if you have an Amazon Echo device, then you can immerse yourself with daily audio lessons or you can learn with the quick word of the day. You can just play a lesson and keep it in the background while you're at home. Just look for Daily Dose by Innovative Language on the Amazon Skill Store and download it for free. Now, if you're looking for some active learning practice and you have some time to concentrate, here are five tactics you can use right now. Number one, listen or watch a lesson and read along with the translations. You'll get complete translations in the lesson notes and the line-by-line -line dialogue. This will make your reading and listening skills skyrocket. The best part is you'll understand every single word. The translations are right in front of you. Number two, repeat the lesson dialogue as you hear it. This is called shadowing and it will boost your speaking skills. Just repeat the lines that you hear until you can speak with confidence. To make it even easier, you can also get the lines in the dialogue study tool and in the lesson notes, so you can read them out loud as you hear them in the lesson. Number three, record yourself with our voice recorder in the dialogue study tool to perfect your pronunciation and see how close you are to a native speaker. Number four, if you want to boost your vocabulary, study words with our smart flashcards. They sort the words for you, so you get the harder words more often until you master them. And the easy ones show up now and then to refresh your memory. And number five, ask questions and practice. Leave a comment in the comment section. If you're a Premium Plus user, you get your very own teacher and you can ask them to review and correct your writing and speaking. You can also ask for learning advice and get all of your questions answered. Both are great ways to learn, but which one is best? Well, that depends on you. If you have some quiet time to focus, active learning is best. But if you're on the train and you're multitasking, then passive learning is the better option. Whichever you choose, you can apply both with our language learning program. So to test out active and passive learning, just check out our complete language learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account by clicking on the link in the description. Get tons of resources to have you speaking in your target language. And if you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a new language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. I'll see you next time. Bye!
Every language learner wants to speak with confidence, without struggling, and without stopping to think of words. So how do you do this? In this video, you'll learn five tactics to perfect your speaking. Above all, every learner wants to speak in their target language with confidence. We've run survey after survey, year after year, and the results are the same. Listening, reading, and writing are all important, but people want to improve their speaking the most. So how do you perfect your speaking skills? First, shadow the dialogues you hear in the lessons. What is shadowing? It's a learning technique where you mimic native speakers. In other words, you listen and then you repeat what they say. This is a fast and easy way to start practicing speaking. You can do this with any one of our audio or video lessons. And even easier, if you have access to the dialogue section, you can read along out loud as you listen. So shadow as much as possible to perfect your speaking and try harder lessons to take yourself to the next level. Second, read the dialogue out loud. We just mentioned this in tip one, but this tactic deserves its own special mention. Reading out loud is another easy way to practice your speaking. Simply read the lesson dialogue that's available in the dialogue section, the lesson notes, or the lesson transcript. By reading out loud, you're practicing your speaking skills. And here's a trick. If you can get yourself to read faster, you'll be able to speak faster too. Natives tend to speak quickly, and if you can too, that's a sign that you're improving. Third, record yourself speaking to perfect your pronunciation. If you're a premium or premium plus member, look for the voice recorder in the dialogue section. With this tool, you can record yourself and compare your speaking to a native speaker. This is powerful because you instantly hear the difference between your speech and the authentic native pronunciation. And then you can easily perfect your speaking and pronunciation. If you don't have a premium account, record yourself with your smartphone. And while you can't really compare, you can spot where you struggle or stutter. This tactic is used by professional speakers, public speakers, just about anyone that has to give a presentation. Fourth, if you're a Premium Plus member, record yourself and send it to your Premium Plus teacher for feedback. Here, you're getting instant feedback from a native speaker. They'll point out your mistakes, they'll tell you what to improve and how, and record themselves and work with you until you reach perfection. That's the power of having a native speaker give you feedback. So what do people usually record? Here's an easy one. Record a one paragraph self intro. In fact, we ask all of our new members to do this. Give your name, your age, where you're from, why you're learning, and that's it. It's a great way to get started. Our more advanced students talk about their day. They send three recordings, in the morning, in the afternoon, and at night. For example, I woke up at 7 a.m. and brushed my teeth. I got ready for work. My train was a little late, and so on. This can dramatically improve your speaking because you're practicing conversations that people have all the time. The fifth way to perfect your speaking, premium plus assignments. With this feature, you get weekly assignments based on your needs and goals, whether they're reading, writing, listening, or speaking. If you want to improve your speaking, your premium plus teacher will send you speaking assignments nonstop every week and provide you with constant feedback. This is all part of your personalized learning experience. So take advantage of our tools and put these tactics to use. And remember, if you want to master your language with our complete language learning program, now's your chance. So to test out these tips and start speaking now, check out our complete language learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account by clicking on the link in the description. Get tons of resources to have you speaking in your target language. And if you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a new language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. I'll see you next time. Bye. Great work. Here's a reward. Speed up your language learning with our PDF lessons. Get all of our best PDF cheat sheets and eBooks for free. Just click the link in the description.